So Lord, we just thank you for this night, uh, that we could just gather together, Lord, just like a family, Lord. It's, it's, it's awesome um, just to be sitting in your church, Lord, just praising your name, Lord, and just uh, opening your word, Lord. We just, we come before you, Lord, and we ask you to speak. Lord, we ask you to, um, to just shower grace upon us, Lord. That as we just, uh, that just our ears would be open to you, Lord, that we would hear the things and uh, be encouraged in your word tonight. Um, so, Lord, we pray those things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, Isaiah is where we've been. We've been here, I don't, I, don't, I don't even know how long it's been, but it's been a while. We're all the way up to chapter 58. So if you uh, have a Bible or you need a Bible, if you need a Bible, you can raise a hand, and, and probably someone will spontaneously throw one at you. <laughs> No, they'll hand it to you. They'll be nice. Um, Isaiah chapter 58, uh, and we're going to be right in verse 1, so that's going to be easy to find. So I'll give you just a second to find that. So we're in um, Isaiah, and we've been continuing along. Like I said, for a long time, we're going to make it to the end of 59 here today, and then we'll be in the home stretch of 60 to 66. So, so we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, 58 chapters into the book of Isaiah, and I, I think you'll notice, and one thing that's true about the prophets is that the themes, they don't, they don't change that often. They're, they're pretty consistent in the message. Still, here we are where we're at tonight. Things have not changed. God's continued patience with his people. God continues to call them out of sin and into restoration. Those are the things that we're camping on tonight, and that's, that's right where we are tonight. Right here in verse 1, we see that. Uh, he said, the Lord says here, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. God is calling them out of their sin for the purpose of calling them to repentance, to renew them to a spirit of, of just soft heartedness where they're, where they're seeking after him truly. Right? It, it, it's a theme. It's a consistent theme throughout the book. Um, and interesting, you know, this idea of restoration through repentance, God just does not tire of this theme. You know, though I might get tired of it, I might just say, well, 58 chapters, Lord, I mean, come on, let's keep moving. There's got to be something else here. God says, no, I'm going to continue to call you back to myself. I'm going to continue to hold out this offer of repentance because I desire that it would be so. You know, like I, I sometimes like watch, I was watching a show the other day and there's this, this bad character and he was like, just, they were just about to kill this bad character. I'm saying, come on, just get rid of him. You know, that's me. And the shows that I watch, you know, that's that's a personal thing. Uh, anyways, no, look at, I am not like God. You know, I am not like God. God is so full of mercy. He's so constant in that mercy. And I think that that's just something that like we should let set in, like just how different God is than us in in His patience, in His desire to always hold out. Um, repentance to his people. God pours out mercy even when we're sapped, like when we're just done with people. God is not done with people. He's a fountain of restoration when all that we can see is desolation. Like when all that we see, see look around and we just see hopelessness, God is faithful to restore. I think remembering that truth like it's encouraging to us because we are in such need of that grace, but I think it especially ought to be a source of encouragement to others through us. As we let that sink into our lives, it should come out as encouragement to others, mean, meaning that, you know, if I know God's mercy, if I know his mercy is so much greater, so much stronger, so much different than my concept of it, if I know his patience is so much longer than my patience, how will that not overflow into my words, into the counsel that I give, and into the way that I speak to people who are in difficult circumstances? Look, I think that we can get to the point where we just grow tired of people. And we forget that the first thing that every person needs is God's mercy and God's love. Look, Paul didn't teach us to like walk in our concept of how much mercy a person deserves or needs, he actually teaches us to walk in, walk in, walk in, in what the Lord sees it as. Colossians 4, 5 through 6, Paul says this. He says, Walk in wisdom to those who are on the outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. 
Look it. There's so many people in this world who are so lost. They're so stuck. And we are to be messengers of God's mercy and grace. It's continually calling people to him. And that's, that's how we are to be to outsiders, people who don't know God. We're to be people who are holding out God's, God's, God's favor to them if they would take it. Look. Sorry, turn the page. I mean, I think it's a good thing to, to ask ourselves. We can, we can inventory our speech. We can kind of look at the way we speak to people who don't know God. Like, do we, do we speak with grace? Is our, is our speech seasoned with that? Or do we understand, like, that God is able to save? Do we understand that he intends to proclaim that message of grace, and he intends to use us to do that, to bring that message of restoration to people? Look at Isaiah is, is crying out. He's raising a voice. He's pointing them back to, to, to him, to, to the Father, to, to his grace. God is using his servant to demonstrate his grace to people. Just something to think about. You know, we, we, we know that God's graceful, but do we remember always that we are to be the instruments by which he's, he's calling people to himself, to that grace in Jesus. Go on, on in verse 2. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Why have we fasted, they say, and you've not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? God was even holding out mercy to these, these people. He was holding it out to them. Yet, he, he, sh he tells us right here in these passages that they were just being hypocrites, right? They were coming before him kind of with this play acting, this, this, this play of, of, of a spirituality before him. God's calling these people to repentance. I mean, look what he, look, he says, like right there in verse 2, he says, They seek me daily, and they delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness, as if they were a people who did righteousness. They come to me with that same attitude. They seek me out with that same attitude as if they were right before me, indicating that, in fact, they are not. So they sought God every day. They prayed. They sought out God's will just as if they were people who cared about righteousness. But God sees through it. He says, no, this is just a sham. This is a show. Like, it's a big deal because these people had the religious thing down. They did their devo time in the morning. They, they spent time with the Lord. It's not just saying that they didn't do those things and they were faking. It's saying they, he, they did those things. They sought him. They sought him as a people. They, they were prayerful people. They were likely seeking him in the word. They were probably attending church regularly. These were, these were religious people. God isn't saying that they just acted like they did those things. He's saying they did those things and yet they had no regard for true righteousness. They spent time in the word, and they obeyed the ritual laws, and even some extra ritual laws just to keep themselves safe. But they failed in this righteousness. They sought the Lord, but still they failed to live righteously before the Lord because they, they forsook the ordinances of God, the true things that God was calling to, uh, out to them. Put on a show of sincerity, a show of sincerity, but they weren't really interested in God's ways, at least not in ways that might be inconvenient to them inconvenient to their interests. And we're going to kind of pull this apart, but I think that just, just understanding that reality, understanding the condition of these people is important. The reality is that these people deluded themselves. They sincerely deluded themselves into believing that they were all good, even to the point where they're approaching God and saying, God, we fasted, we cried out to you, and you didn't listen. They were totally blind to their sin. What happened to these people? I, I think it's worth asking because... I don't know about you, but we're all here in church. I think we're at least fairly religious on, on the spectrum of, of, of people who, who could be. Like, like, but are we truly seeking the Lord? Are we seeking him out day by day in a sincere way? I think there's a danger in studying the Old Testament, not that the old, studying the Old Testament is dangerous, but it's a care to take. Because unless we're careful, it's easy for us to like, read about, uh, about the ancient Israelites and their relationship with God and just say, oh, 
those silly Israelites. Like, they were so silly. Good thing I'm not so silly. They're just, they're just caught up in their religious games. I would never do anything like that. You know, we can kind of put them over there and us over here, but I think God gives us his word that we might see in the air of the ways of the people who, who, who were shown, like, how we could err the same way. How we could be falling into a delusion of religiosity. We need to know and remember that there is much risk for us to fall into that same trap of religious delusion unless we take care. Because it is possible, it is possible for a person to handle the word of God regularly, to sit under, under Bible teaching, to pray and to seek the Lord, but still not to grow, not to be transformed, and instead to grow hard-hearted. That is possible. That is a very real possibility, one that we ought to be on guard against. These people to whom Isaiah is speaking, they're an example of this. They had grown hard over time, despite their having been in the word, despite their having been seeking the things of God, there was a hardness, a calcification coming into their lives. See, the word, according to Hebrews 4, 12, it's living and it's active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. I love that. I love that description. That's a good one to keep, to keep in our minds. The word of God, it's sharp, it's dynamic, and it cuts when it's effective, right? That's what a sword is for, to cut. And the word of God has been given to us for that purpose, the separation of, of flesh and spirit, that it might make a difference in our lives, that it might come in and, and do a spiritual work within us. It's there to cut away the things that don't belong, the cancers of sin that, 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 that abound in our lives. Like the word of God is there to transform us, to bring about that transformation, to bring about greater faith, greater trust. It's been given to us as an instrument of self-pruning, to mix my metaphors, right? That, 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 that it would be used really to prune away the things that do not belong in our lives. That's what the word of God is here for. And if we are to stay in that place of receptiveness to the Lord, soft-heartedness, sincerity before him, then we need to be pruned often. That's the nature of, our, just, just of, of us as sinful people. There's plenty within me, and I just attest to my own personal experience, and the word would say is true of you as well. There's plenty that grows in me that springs out of my sinful heart that's just self-delusional and needs to be taken away by the word. It needs to be pruned away. It needs to be removed. Or else it gets in the way. It chokes out what the Lord wants to do. See, the word of God is an instrument, a two-edged sword, that is used to be used against ourselves, our own hearts. The word of God is, is sharp, and the man or woman who uses it as it is meant to be used will walk away with scars. Right? Right? Anything sharp, when, it, when, it, when it's effective, when it's doing what it takes, it's going to leave a mark. But these people didn't bother with that. They didn't bother to cut away the rot. Instead, they just stopped tending themselves with the word. You know what I'm saying? They had this tool, but they didn't have the will to use it. They wanted the healing, but not the scars. Look, I think it's... It's a question to ask ourselves, is what about us who are here today? Like, is God pruning you? What is he pruning away in your life? Where has he left a mark, say, in the past year in your life? Like, where is he working that, that you can say, man, I could see that God came in and he just took that thing away? Amen. It's a good question, I think, to reflect on because the truth is that, you know, if God's word is active in our lives, if it's going deep within us, it's going to leave us with marks. And we can account for those things. I know all the scars I have on all my, my body. I can tell you the stories of them. Right? And if God's word is at work in us, we can tell the story of how, man, he is transforming us. Going deep into our hearts, taking out those things and exposing them and removing them. In our walks with Jesus, we're going to have scars in the places where he's, where he's changing, where he's convicting. But what we can do with the word is we can keep it at a safe distance. You can keep it at a safe distance. And I believe truly that this had to be what was going on here. 
keeping it away from me. It makes sense that a sharp object you would keep away from you because it can hurt sometimes when God is working on us. But we are to bring the word into us and to let it take its effect. Look, these Hebrews, they sought the Lord, but they failed to let the word do the work upon them, to get down to their souls. Look, a small note. I think that it's um, easy for a believer to get to a place where they say, well, the word just isn't convicting me anymore. You know, it's not doing what it once did in my life. The word isn't uh, exciting like it once um, was, and we just can become resigned to that. You know, where we just say, well, so it is. Can I just suggest to you, that if that's where you are, and I have been there before, by the way, that that needs to be pruned away. That needs to be taken away. The fault is not with the word. The fault's not with your pastor. The fault is that you're being overgrown and there's pruning in order. That, that problem that the word no longer is, is, is convicting, that the word no longer, we've just kind of grown hard to it. That needs to brought, be brought before the Lord seriously, prayerfully, urgently, in fasting and in the power of the Holy Spirit. It, it's, 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 it's not a healthy place to be because it's, it's a terminal situation. And, and that's what the Lord is calling them to. He's, he's exposing their hearts here. The prognosis what the, the, uh, is what these people were looking at. I did a lot of is there. I'm sorry. Anyways, let's keep going on. Uh, halfway through verse 3, beginning with in fact. In fact, again, he's, he's exposing them. He says, he says, look how hard you become to my word. He says, you, you're, just, you're just putting on a show. In verse 3, in fact, in the day that you fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Is it the fast that I've chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Uh, is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this, fa this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Look, they're shown exactly how little the word has had an effect on them by the prophet. It says they fast before the Lord to demonstrate their sincerity. He says, but all of it is just meaningless because the primary issue of the word working in their lives was neglected. They failed to let the word in to take root in them. They're confused about what the Lord's asking them. You know, they thought God was interested or moved by them just, just fasting, ripping their clothing, laying low, laying down, prostrating before them. But that's, he's saying that's not it. In fact, God makes it simple. He says, you just need to do what's right. You need to cease to oppress the poor, to follow me with a pure heart. Let the word transform you. Take care to see it, to see it work. God simplifies things in a, in a way, and, and you know, we can, we've talked extensively about justice issues, and, and so I, I, I realize I'm leaving some stuff right there, um, but we can go back and listen to that. We, John's talked about that a lot throughout this, this series. Um, God cl clarifies what they were missing here in verse 6. He says, is this not the fast that I have chosen? to loose the bonds of the wicked, of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring your house, uh, bring to your house the poor who are cast out when you see the naked that you cover him and not hide him, hide yourself from your own flesh in your light, and then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spread spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard, and then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, here I am. God's very clear about the problem here. The problem is that you fast, but it's not the fast that I've appointed. It's not in the manner in which I've appointed fasting. Fasting is a really interesting topic in the Bible. Um, a lot of fasting went on in ancient Israel. However, interestingly, the only time where it was commanded by God in terms of the rituals of, of the law was only on the Day of Atonement, one time per year. And yet we read the Old Testament, you know, reading read Kings and Samuel, they're fasting all the time. I mean, sure, we're, we're focusing in on tragic events usually in, in, the, in those times, momentous events, but there was a lot of fasting.
And God explains to them at this point why their fasting is fruitless, because he says it's really just, it's not going to come to anything, um, because it's not the appointed fast. And God's not arguing here that they weren't, you know, fasting on the wrong day or in the wrong, like, ritual manner. Uh, he's arguing that they were fasting inappropriately because of their hearts. It was okay for them to fast, to seek the Lord, even outside of the ritual calendar. That was all good. God, God loved it when, 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 when people sincerely sought him and fasted. And God still loves that, by the way. But the problem was that their hearts and the outflow of their hearts was not resulting in, in, in things that God valued, that he cared for. It didn't result in the care for the poor, care for the oppressed. The problem was what they had neglected their fundamental duty as children of God to, in the list, list of the series, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke, to share your bread with the hungry, to bring to your house the poor who are cast out, to cover the naked, and to hide, and you hide yourself from your own flesh. Right? He says, he says this is, the calling of God's people is to care for, for, for the world. They had neglected that, They've neglected that work of turning the word upon themselves and understanding what God is calling them to do. To let the word push back against them. Instead, they'd grown hard and impenetrable to the word and at a great cost. And I don't think this could be really much more relevant to us today. We want to say, oh, well, this was so long ago, and, you know, that was the old covenant. We're in the new covenant. A lot has changed in that time. The new covenant, like, is awesome. We are sealed in the blood of Jesus. He's, he's the guaranteed of abundant mercy for you and I and anyone who would call upon him. But I want to say that the dynamics of growing in our faith remains the same. It's essential for a fruitful believer in Jesus Christ to see the word impact them, that their life would, would come to, to, to be shaped and formed by God's word. In fact, I would argue that it's even more relevant and more pressing for us today, both because of the times that we've appointed to live in, the urgency of these times, what God wants to do in these times, and the grace that's available to us in Christ. I think there's a line in thinking, and I don't think everybody, anyone really honestly embraces this, but it's kind of like an excuse. There's a line of thinking in pop culture, that, in Christian pop culture, that says, you know, it just doesn't matter what I do with the grace that God's given me. Because there's just mercy in Jesus, and he's paid the price for my sins, and so I don't need to take care to honor his word. I, I don't need to take care because, you know, I'm good either way. I got my ticket to heaven. I'm all set. It doesn't matter if I care for the poor. It doesn't matter if I love, love, love my brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter. I can just fold my hands and relax. But that's just not the counsel of God. I mean, certainly not, it's not what the Bible teaches. Look, Hebrews 12, 28, I think, says it really good. 28 and 29. Points to the, actually, the, the greater urgency that we have now. He says this, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Or to paraphrase that a little bit, he's saying, look, at, in light of God's mercy and his forgiveness of sins, which, which is just like a, 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 it's firm, it's, it's unmoving, in light of that firmness, like let us press on all the more. Let us take all the more care to seek him and to, to seek him and, and to plead for with him for the grace to revere him rightly. Look, we can look at the word of God and we can look at what Jesus has done and say, oh, well, that's my excuse. That's my carte blanche. I can do what I want now. The Bible says, look at his grace. Look at his mercy. Look at the assurance of salvation that you have in Christ. Ought that not to press you more into, into his word, to revere him, to seek him more? To know him more. It's a really different perspective. With the Christian life that just seeks to be excused from, from really letting the word do a work in us, it's boring, it's joyless, and it's useless. If we neglect to live in light of God's sure mercy, that's what we'll get. Because God's mercy, mercy has set us free that we might seek him for all that he has, like all of the transformation and all the, 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 the good things that he wants to do in us. Amen. Look what God promises will happen. And picking up in the middle of verse 9 here. 
It says, if you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking the wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as noonday and the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones and you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Look, God's point is this, is that you can spiritualize everything all day long, but unless there's real transformation, real work in your life, you're missing it. If, if your spirituality doesn't overflow into a practical love for other people, then it's going to fall flat. It's going to leave you flat. It's going to leave them flat. But if we would... If we would take up what God calls us to, let the word come in and transform us, the alternative is so much more appealing. I mean, just reread the 10 and 11. Uh, reread that. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like so cool what God wants to do. To guide us, to satisfy us, to strengthen us, to refresh us, to be a spring of living water. That's awesome. In verse 12, those from among you shall build the old waste places, and you shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorers of the streets to dwell in. Look, the life that's been pruned by God's word, it becomes effective. The life that's been shaped by him will be, by virtue of the grace working in us, transformed. And look at, look at what he's saying. And what he's saying here is great. He says that life is the sort of life that gets a name for itself. It gets a name for itself. It gets a reputation for being all about the good things of God. I mean, think about that. Look, how is a reputation formed? How is a legacy crafted? I think it's through the diligent and consistent and lifelong pursuit of good things. Like, you think back on, on good men and women that you've known, you think who've left a good legacy behind. And what did they do? They were consistent. They were faithful. God calls us to faithfulness. The Lord's showing us that what true and sincere worship of him will lead to, it will turn into a legacy of restoration, reconciliation, of God's mercy being poured out on this world. Look, if God is working in my heart effectively to the point where I'm being transformed, it's going to show. People are going to see that. Verse 13 if you turn away from your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. So the law of the, of the Jews, right, of the religious observances of Judaism, uh, called the Jews to keep the Sabbath day as a day set apart unto the Lord. And I think you guys are familiar with that. And um, just as with fasting, though, the Lord looks at these rituals that they're practicing, and he says, look, it's empty. It's empty if the heart isn't right. The keeping of the law is meaningless. The keeping of the Sabbath is meaningless if your heart isn't right before me. I mean, and for us who are not under the obligation to perform the rituals of Judaism, I would argue that it is also true and urgent. Colossians 2.17 says this about, about the Sabbath days and other rituals. It says this, those things, Sabbath days, other rituals, are a shadow of the thing to come, but the substance is of Christ. Right? So it says, it says these rituals and, and commandments of the Old Testament, they were, they were pointing to something greater that we now have in Christ. Look, we know, we who know Jesus know we don't need to observe those days and rituals. Rather, we get to observe Jesus. Like we don't have to look to the, the lesser thing. We have the greater thing. The thing that is, that is more honorable, which is to live a life in the, in, in the presence of God, we get to observe Jesus daily, to be with him daily, to be in his will, always seeking his pleasure, delighting in the reality of what he's done, and walking in the inheritance of a new life that he's bought for us. Isaiah, um, 
he kind of describes a, the walk of a person who's honoring God on that Sabbath day or on any day. And he says these, I, lo- I love these words, you shall honor him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, but rather delighting yourself in the Lord. <laughs> we can't content ourselves, like if, if we know Jesus, Uh, with our accomplishments of some ritual, like that's not a proxy for a relationship with Jesus. Rather, those of us who are in Jesus, who know him, who like are being filled up with him, like we need to seek that grace to, to, to be be transformed by him to the point where it's just like, man, I don't have my words anymore. I, I'm just yours, Lord. Like I'm giving you my life and you're transforming and you're influencing. You're strengthening and empowering me. The joy that awaits us then, I, I, I don't think it's expressible. It's not just like one day of rest, but it's just a continual resting, of being refreshed from the Lord. Like that's what we have if, if, we would just, if we would just seek him out. Going on in 59, Isaiah 59, we're just going to, we're almost done here. We're going to go only halfway through 59 actually. Okay. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that, he, so that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perversities. The Lord explains to these people yet again that it's not God's inability to do something to save them. That's the problem. The problem lies in themselves, in their their own sin, their own hardness against the Lord. The problem is with their persistent unwillingness to repent. That's a theme we've been seeing over and over and over again as God is calling the people to repent. Going on in verse 4, no one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. They hatch vipers' eggs and weave the spider's web. He who eats their eggs dies, and from that which is crushed, a viper breaks out. Their webs will not become garments, nor will they cover themselves with their work. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hand. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their path. And the way of peace they have not known. And there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes the way shall not know peace. And we would, I think, do well to consider the reality of these men and women to to whom Isaiah is addressing, who are just like, just, I mean, exposed for their sin. And I, I think that, in fact, it's likely if we were to look at them, to look at their lives, these people whom Lord, the Lord is just saying are like so far from him that we would not think them nearly as guilty. Like we would look at their lives and just say, oh, these aren't, this isn't that bad, Lord. See, just as I think we lack a capacity to understand God's mercy and, 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 his, and his perseverance and patience, I think we also fail to recognize the offensiveness of sin to the Lord. Like how sin just corrupts entirely. We could try to argue um, that these were really bad people, and, and I suppose the argument can be made, but when I look at these, like the things that are being said about them, I think it's more likely scenario that these were people who were guilty of respectable sins. Like they were guilty of, of respectable sins, the kind of things that we would just say, eh, well, that's not that big of a deal, right? The kinds of sin that we would give a, a pass in our own lives to. We just say, eh. But the way that God's describing their sin here I mean, they don't seem like murderers and robbers. It seems that their sins are rather a failure to abide in the Lord, a failure of the tongue, a failure to trust in, in good things, but in, in instead to trust in false things, things of this world and not of the Lord. Those things are not small things in his mind. I mean, he's not saying that they're going around killing people. He's not saying that these people are even, even drunkards. He's saying, man, they've trusted in false things. I, mean, I don't know. You know. I don't know everything about these people. But I know that I have made my sin much smaller than God sees it in the past. Verse 9, Therefore justice is far from us, nor does righteousness overtake us. 
we look for light, but there is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in blackness. We grope for the wall like a, the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as at twilight. We are as dead men in desolate places. We all growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We look for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. And here, there seems to be a, a confession. You notice the word us is used here, right? So it seems like some people, at least, are responding to, to, to God's call. And it's a way of repentance that is, is modeled for us. And I think it's, it's a good model. You'll always notice in biblical repentance, um, there's no like mitigating circumstances. There's no, oh God, I did wrong, but I had so many good excuses for why I did it. It's always just like, just out there, no self-defense. Rather, the person who is repenting just embraces their total failure. I think we just see a good model in there. I mean, look at the language. Um, some great word pictures kind of describing the person who's stuck in sin. Like, I mean, like, look for light, but there's only darkness. They grope as if they had no eyes. How utterly lost the person is, is who is in sin. And this is what God sees. This is what God sees. And this is what God has put on their hearts about the condition that they were in. That they were totally blind and lost. With their respectable sins, they had totally cut themselves off from the Lord. Verse 12, for our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, as, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the streets and equity cannot enter. And so truth fails. And he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The failure of these people was one of, of submission to the Lord, lying to him, departing from him, conceiving falsehoods. Just a couple of things listed right here. And I think that we, we can just say, I mean, look at, look at, we see that in their confession, they had no idea how, how far they had wandered. They had no conception of it. They had no clue that they were on that path of rebellion because they had just grown so insensitive to God's word. I mean, so impenetrable, God, so hardened against God's word. And that just had to be broken. We said it already, but I think it needs to be said again. A heart that is no longer moved by the word, a life that is just, just kind of, calcified against it, that's kind of grown defensive against the word. And that is a dangerous condition to stay in. Look, in terms of the way God sees repentance, it's a gift. Repentance is a gift. Kind of a, a renewed spirit, a softness of heart is a gift. And it's a gift that God gives. He wants to give willingly. It's a prayer that he delights in answering. He delights in giving his people a renewed desire to honor him in sincerity and truth. That is a fast a prayer that he would respond to. To the one who is hungry, to want to be renewed with a soft heart. Look, I just want us to all remember that right now. We're not doing an altar call or anything like that. But look, I regularly, regularly have to do this. I mean, I regularly have to get to the point where I just look at, look at myself in the mirror and I just say, like, how long has it been? How long has my hard heart just, just been running the show? Like, and I've just been cutting myself off from the word. And I need God to sh show me that on a regular basis. Um, I think that's just the nature of, of where we're at, this side of heaven. And um, so I would just uh, encourage you guys just to continue on. Um, I think we're going to get to some, some awesome stuff here coming up in, in chapter 60 next week. Uh, John will be back. Um, but let's just pray. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord. I thank you. I thank you for your word, Lord. And, um, Lord, I just pray for just a renewed desire to be just shaped by it, God. Lord, what hope do I have? Like, there's no good within me, no good within us, Lord. So we just turn to you, Lord, the shepherd um, who knows us, Lord, who made us, Lord, to uh, just renew us, Lord, Re restore in us that desire for you, for you, the things of your, 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 your things, Lord, things that are from you. God, we pray that you would just renew us, Lord, individually, renew this church, Lord. Let us be um, 
just like breaking forth, like light breaking forth, Lord, in this dark place, Lord, that the people would just know how good you are, how merciful, how kind you are. Pray that in uh, Jesus' name. Amen. Good night.